Peter B. Collins News and Comment. It's Thursday, December 13th, 2018. I don't want to cry on your shoulder, but it's been one of those weeks where technology has been oppositional. We had a power outage for three hours the other day, and every morning I come in and all my computers have crashed and shut down. I'm hanging on by a digital thread here, but we shall persevere. And if you're fresh to my podcast, what I do every day is I choose about the 10 most important stories that I think you should be informed on. And I clip articles, I mark up the pages, and then I sit down and talk about it. And today, I have over 20 stories. Usually it's about 10. But these are stories I think you should know about, so in some cases, I'll give you a little more information than comment today. And I want you to contrast this. If you're a regular viewer of MSDNC, (laughs) there is so much news that they don't cover anymore, because it's all about Russia and getting rid of Trump with the Cohen, uh, you know, sentencing that occurred yesterday, and we'll get to that. But it's pretty deep in my stack today because there's so much other important news. Nancy Pelosi is wheeling and dealing. As I mentioned yesterday, she's the new Monty Hall playing Let's Make a Deal to pick up the votes that she needs to regain the speakership in January. And as we touched on yesterday, she's made a deal to limit her service to four more years. And I believe that she actually will step down after the 2020 election. But she doesn't want to be a lame duck by saying, oh, I'm only going to serve two years and then I'll go. And she said, well, she's made this agreement so that she can be a bridge to the next generation of leaders, a recognition of her continuing responsibility to mentor and advance new members into positions of power and responsibility. So she can only afford to lose 17 Democratic votes in the speaker uh, election, which will come up on the first day of the new session. I think that's going to be around January 3rd or 4th. And so she's been busy meeting with the people who campaigned on a promise not to support Nancy Pelosi for speaker. And because she has no opposition... Most of those people, conservative Democrats, can say, well, gosh, you know, (laughs) I couldn't vote for myself and nobody else was running. But they have used their position, their leverage, to extract deals from Nancy Pelosi. So, for example, the four-year deal. Then she embraced a rule change by moderate Democrats intending to foster more bipartisan legislating. Doesn't cost her anything. It's basically a deal saying that if there is bipartisan consensus, it will automatically go to the floor for a vote. And she doesn't have to give up much to take out centrists like Lipinski of Illinois, Gottheimer of New Jersey, Stephanie Murphy of Florida. Then there was Marsha Judge, the African-American from Ohio, who was the only one who momentarily thought about challenging Pelosi for speaker. Well, she's being picked off by a promise to head the election subcommittee, and uh, that will be chaired by Marsha Fudge. Then she agreed to prioritize infrastructure legislation and a proposal to allow people 50 and older to buy into Medicare. Now, that is a baby step toward Medicare for all, but... It won the support of Brian Higgins of New York, and that's how she is using her power effectively to pick up the votes that she needs to become Speaker. And uh, in case you don't know, I've known Nancy Pelosi here in San Francisco since she was first elected to Congress in the 1980s. I worked on her campaign in 1996. I have great respect for her and her leadership, even as I respectfully disagree with her on many of her political decisions. So uh, what is interesting, David Dayen points out over at The Intercept today, that progressives are flexing their power and they're pushing Pelosi to the left. For example, the Progressive Caucus won a victory yesterday, scuttling a rule that was imposed by Speaker Newt Gingrich after the 1994 Republican takeover of the House, requiring a three-fifths majority to increase taxes. That would get in the way of Medicare for All, of uh, expanding college tuition uh, subsidies, of uh, helping people out on the college loans that they have, the student debt. So 
tweet from the Progressive Caucus. We're pleased to announce that the rules package for the 116th Congress will not include the three-fifth supermajority tax provision promoted by House Republicans in recent years. They've also pushed back on Pelosi's support of what's called pay-go or pay-as-you-go, meaning that if you spend a million dollars, you've got to cut a million dollars somewhere else. And because the Republicans. Only impose fiscal responsibility when there is a Democrat in the White House or Democrats controlling the House or Senate. It is silly for the Republic. I'm sorry for the Democrats to impose limits on themselves when any effort to balance the budget to be fiscally prudent will be just rolled over by the Republicans. So I consider these to be important gains for progressives, and I'm glad to see it. But the struggle continues in an effort to get Pelosi to agree to back what they're calling a new Green Deal. And this is coming from the environmental left. They have 22 Democratic members of the House joining for a call to set up a select committee on a Green New Deal. And to some people, this may just be window dressing, but because the Democrats will control the House for the next two years, it allows them to set an agenda to pass legislation, even if it doesn't clear the Senate, that can、uh, at least set a a benchmark for what the Democrats believe in, and that is sorely missing in the Democratic Party today. So、uh, they are still pressing. To、uh, reject the influence of carbon industries, Democrats got five million dollars total from them in the midterm election cycle, and I think that this is a worthy effort. And it becomes even more important when you see the New York Times report today about the way the Trump administration, at the behest of Ohio.、Uh, Refinery giant Marathon Petroleum. They're based in Findlay, Ohio. And as a young man working at a radio station near there, I went and called on them to try to get them to advertise on our radio station. That was a long, long time ago. But Marathon、uh, bulked up. They bought the second largest refinery,、uh, refinery company last year, putting them in the top position. They're deeply aligned with the Koch brothers and with our fine friends at Alec, the American Legislative Exchange Council, and together, Marathon, Koch brothers, Alec. Have really gained ground in trying to scuttle the fuel efficiency and emissions standards for automobiles that were set under the Obama administration, and it's not the car companies that are demanding the rollback. It is the oil companies and the gasoline retailers, and they're winning this battle. They've got talking points out there that are routinely repeated by Republicans and some Democrats. That gosh, we're a wash in oil. We've got a glut. Why should we, you know, <laughs> why should we restrain ourselves? And of course, it requires climate change denial and just a general、uh, <laughs> profligacy that、uh, is so inappropriate and so confounding to those of us who hold other positions. And this also sets up the fight with California. We have stricter standards for mileage and for emissions and for the mix that goes into our gasoline products. There are 13 other states that support the California rules, but the Trump administration is determined to force us all under a national and weaker standard. And I'm sure that、uh, Governor-elect Gavin Newsom is going to fight pretty hard against that. When he is sworn in in early January, also back under Obama, we saw that protesters of the Keystone XL, protesters who joined Bill McKibben in the 350.org campaign, they were subject to surveillance and scrutiny by the police state apparatus that we were told was built to protect us from. Uh, those、uh, jihadi terrorists who want us all dead. And back in 2010, the Inspector General reported how the FBI had inappropriately tracked activist groups like Greenpeace and Catholic Worker. These are nonviolent First Amendment protesters. They should not be subject to police surveillance. 
and we thought that、uh, Obama had put the end an end to that in 2010, at least、uh, when it came to environmentalists, not the、uh, not not of course the Occupy movement. But we're now learning because the Guardian newspaper in Britain used the Freedom of Information Act in the United States to get documents showing that on May 15th of 2016, while Obama was still president, a protest in Whiting, Indiana, involving about a thousand protesters who marched to the BP refinery, led to the investigation of key participants in that rally. Now, get this—they were investigated even though this was a permitted march. This is not just a bunch of people, you know, showing up. This was people who were organized. They had law enforcement approval for the event, and nevertheless, they were subject to detailed scrutiny by our government. Now, here's a win that、uh, we can celebrate for about 30 seconds. Yesterday, the Senate, by a one-vote margin, and that vote was provided by the Quixotic、uh, Senator Susan Collins of Maine. Fifty forty nine, the Senate approved a resolution, a resolution from Senator Tester of Montana and Wyden of Oregon, that'll block the recent Treasury Department change to IRS forms, which allow political nonprofits to avoid listing some donors. That's dark money, friends. And Wyden said the Trump administration's dark money rule makes it easier for foreigners and special interests to corrupt and interfere in our elections. So it did pass, but there isn't a companion bill in the House, and so it will die at the end of this session. But it shows that <laughs> there is just a little support in the Senate for disclosure of donors. Mitch McConnell, who loves all kinds of dark money, spun it up this way. He said the resolution is an attempt by some of our Democratic colleagues to undo a pro-privacy reform. And he feels bad for the donors who might be exposed in a climate that's increasingly hostile to certain kinds of political expression and open debate. The last thing Washington needs to do is chill the exercise of free speech. So, if you have to hide your identity, is that free speech? I don't think so, Mitch. I don't. Jackie Speer is a Bay Area Congresswoman, a Democrat, and she is announcing that she has bipartisan support for a measure that will change who pays for settlements related to sexual harassment and discrimination by members of the House. Since the 1997 or so, we have spent taxpayers 17 million dollars to pay off accusers. Of members of the House, and starting in January with the new Congress, it's a matter of personal responsibility. Don't you love to see <laughs> the people who lecture us about our need for personal responsibility being forced to accept it? This gets ugly, friends. I have been railing for the last couple of weeks about the schemes by Republicans in Wisconsin and Michigan. To use their power to limit the power of Democrats who were elected to office in November and who will start serving next month, but Democrats are trying to do it too. This time in New Jersey, which has brought us corrupt people like Senator Bob Menendez and the dirty deal that put Frank Lautenberg back in the Senate、uh, for a term or two after、uh, it looked like、uh, the Democrat nominee was going to lose. Well, now. The power grab the Democrats have in mind is to essentially make Republicans a permanent endangered species, a permanent minority, and they have a scheme where the district maps would be drawn in part based on the division between Republican and Democratic voters in the state, and the Democrats enjoy about a one million registration voter margin. So you can imagine how that would ripple through. New Jersey has not elected a Republican senator since 1972, and、uh, Chris Christie and Tom Kane are kind of the anomalies of Republicans who have served as governor in recent years. But、uh, this is a really ugly, stinky plan, and we can only hope that Governor Phil Murphy will veto it if it reaches his desk. Meanwhile, the schemers in Michigan, the Republicans in the legislature, are continuing their rearguard action. They're angry that ballot measures set up a new independent redistricting committee that is going to limit their ability to gerrymander the congressional seats after the 2020 census. 
And so the lawmakers are trying to make it hard for people to mount ballot drives after voters last month legalized marijuana for adult use and overhauled the redistricting process. And also, this, maneuver, this comes after the cynical maneuver by Republicans. Get this. They were threatened by a ballot n- initiative that was going to raise the minimum wage and increase paid sick time. And so they passed laws that raised the minimum wage and increased paid sick time. And they are cynically ignoring the will of voters, as they did a few years ago, when voters repealed the emergency manager law and the legislature just put it right back into effect. That's how democracy works in the Great Lakes state of Michigan. Every day I pause for a moment to thank the people who support my work here at the Peter B. Collins podcast with your subscriptions. Find folks like Susan Gavet, Jim Garrison, Ted Kelly, Terry Paris. They all kick in five, ten, twenty dollars a month to support my work, and you can do it too. It is the holiday season, and that motivates some people. I don't want to be presumptuous, but if you are so motivated, come on over to PeterBCollins.com. Find the menu button, click on Become a Subscriber, you'll land on the sign up page, and it just takes a few seconds to set up a subscription with a PayPal account. And if you don't like PayPal, yo comprendo, you can communicate with me by the U.S. mail at Box 150 660. San Rafael, California, 94915. Well, yesterday as I was recording the podcast, they were taking the no-confidence vote in the parliament in London, and Theresa May survived. But she had to make a dubious bargain to do so. To win over wavering lawmakers, Theresa May said she will step down before the next scheduled election in 2022. And if history is any indication, it could come much sooner than that. When the Iron Lady, Margaret Thatcher, won a no-confidence vote in 1990, she resigned from office just a few days later. So uh, Brexit, of course, is an extenuating circumstance here. But Theresa May has no additional leverage just because she survived the no-confidence vote. The European Union is refusing politely to renegotiate any of the terms, and she appears to have very little flexibility in trying to get the measure through Parliament at this point. I think it's going to be a long slog. Well, yesterday in Sweden, a breakthrough occurred. The warring parties from Yemen agreed to an immediate ceasefire, related to the Red Sea port of Hodeida, and this is critical. It could allow for the shipment of badly needed food supplies into a nation where over 10 million people are estimated to be facing imminent famine. The deal was brokered by the U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres. This includes, he says, the future deployment of U.N. supervised uh, forces, the establishment of humanitarian corridors. Troops from both sides will withdraw from the entire Hodeida area within 21 days. They've agreed to a next round of meetings at the end of January to talk about a political framework. And this deal is the most promising effort so far. But the unknown is what MBS will do. What will the crown prince of Saudi Arabia do? Will he accept that it's time for him to stop bombing civilians in Yemen on a daily basis? Or will he plunge forward relentlessly and ignoring the uh, sentiments of other people? (laughs) Now, yesterday, those sentiments were kind of mangled on Capitol Hill in both houses. The knuckle-dragging senator, Republican from Arkansas, Tom Cotton, threw monkey wrenches into Bernie Sanders' effort to pass a uh, a resolution instructing Trump to remove U.S. forces from the hostilities in Yemen because the Cotton uh, poison pill amendments uh, took up a lot of the oxygen in the Senate. And we'll have to see uh, what comes out of that over the next few days. And over in the House, it was a remarkable series of maneuvers by the lame duck speaker, Paul Ryan. He is a double lame duck because the Republican majority is going going away at the end of this month. And because he has stepped down, uh, he'll be a lobbyist within, uh, within weeks, probably. Anyway, yesterday, the War Powers Resolution that was pending in the House, was tucked into an unconventional vote related to the Farm Bill and using a rule that said we're not going to talk about war powers for the remainder of this session 
It passed with five Democratic votes, by only three votes total. Let's name those Democrats: Jim Costa of California, Al Lawson, Colin Peterson, Dutch Ruppersberger of Maryland, and Congressman David Scott. Thanks a lot, guys. Really appreciate that. Meanwhile, the strongman leader of Turkey, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, warned the United States that he is going to roust the Kurdish fighters who have been central to the U.S. proxy war in Syria from their redoubt across the Euphrates River from the border with Turkey. He says we will soon begin our operation to rescue east of the Euphrates from the separatist organization. Our target is not American soldiers. It is what he refers to as terror organizations that are active in the region, and he accuses the U.S. of not honoring its pledge to get the Kurds out of there. Referring to the U.S., he said they're not being honest. They're still not removing what he calls terrorists. Therefore, we will do it. The Associated Press has a report today that's providing a little more information, not full details. On the skirmish a month ago that nearly led to a full-scale war between Israel and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Now you may recall that、uh, rockets were launched from Gaza. Israel responded with brutal air raids on what they identified as Hamas targets in Gaza. But we're now learning that this was a result of a botched Israeli covert commando operation. They had managed to insert a van load of spies into Gaza. The van was posed as a, belonging to a Palestinian aid group. They had a wheelchair and a woman who was posing as a disabled person, and they were pretending to move disabled people to hospitals in that van. They visited many houses. They even rented a, an apartment in Gaza City. The scheme began to unravel when the team made its way to the town of Abbasan. Suspicious residents alerted Hamas security. They stopped the van, and then when a commander, Nur Baraka of Hamas, arrived, well, the Israeli team opened fire and killed him. And as the commandos fled, Hamas security fired back, and they claimed they killed the Israeli commander.、Uh, we deserve to know more about that, but both sides are keeping pretty mum about it. Just in time for the Christmas season, you know, the war on Christmas that Trump talks about. Well, he has decided to brutally deport a group of Cambodians, many of whom have lived in the United States legally since the 1970s or 1980s. The first group of 46 deportees are scheduled to arrive in Cambodia next week. Many of these people have no memories of Cambodia. They left as part of the exodus after the Khmer Rouge started massacring people, and many of them have green cards and have. Lived here without any criminal behavior, but Trump is busy, busy hurting people. That's what it boils down to. I'm recovering from a bit of whiplash because as I looked at the New York Times website this morning, there were two articles posted next to each other. One with the headline "A Weakened China Tries a Different Approach with the U.S. Treading Lightly," and this is related to the tariff war, the trade war, and. The arrest in Vancouver on December 1st of the Chinese telecom executive Meng Wanzhou. Now this puts Canada in the middle of a dispute between the U.S. and China, and we are told that China is treading lightly, taking a measured response to the Huawei incident, and agreeing to allow U.S. cars and food and energy to be imported into China. But the history is that China will save face. They will make moves, but they don't stick with them. And so, I don't know that this treading lightly can be taken seriously. Then the article posted right next to it reads: "Second Canadian arrested in China, escalating diplomatic feud." Now, I think this escalation is serious. I think that involving Canada. Makes it a multinational problem, not just bilateral. And these two Canadians, one with diplomatic、uh, background, have been accused of crimes, national security crimes in China. Now this is an escalation. I don't consider this treading lightly. Do you? And now, as promised to Michael Cohen and his former boss, Trump tweeted this morning. 
I never directed Michael Cohen to break the law. He was a lawyer, and he's supposed to know the law. And then in one of his fatuous claims, <laughs> he said, Cohen was guilty on many charges unrelated to me. But he pled to two campaign charges which were not criminal and of which he probably was not guilty even on a civil basis. Now, this is the claim Trump tried to make yesterday. And it doesn't hold water in any respect because the central issue here is the campaign finance violations that are felonies that Cohen has pled to and that implicate Trump directly. And so, trying to wriggle out of it, Trump really just compounds his errors. And after the sentencing hearing in the courtroom in New York yesterday, the Southern District U.S. Attorney's Office announced a settlement deal with the publisher of the National Enquirer. And the publisher admitted to paying off a Playboy model and that it was an effort to cover up the president's dirty deeds, as Michael Cohen called them. And in the, the agreement, AMI, the parent of the National Enquirer, admitted that its principal purpose in making the payment was to suppress the woman's story so as to prevent it from influencing the election. Now, I don't want to use the term slam dunk, but this is very strong corroboration of the testimony of Michael Cohen. And the noose is getting tighter on Trump and his family members. But I think the most significant connection or possible connection to Russia relates to the guilty plea entered by Maria Butina in Washington today. She is the 30-year-old. She dyes her hair red, and so people think of her as a redhead. But coming out of jail, they don't uh, allow those products in, so she, she's back to being just a regular brunette. But she, was, uh, she pled guilty to a single charge of conspiring to act as a foreign agent, and she has agreed to cooperate. She admitted to being involved in an organized effort backed by Russian officials to open up unofficial lines of communication with influential Americans in the National Rifle Association and the Republican Party. But get this. In the filing, the prosecutors backed off from earlier claims that she had used sex as part of her spycraft and acknowledged in court that she genuinely was working on a graduate degree at American University, not just using that as cover. And they dropped accusations that she was in contact with Russian intelligence agencies. Now, that is crucial because it suggests to me that whatever scheme she was operating under, and there is some circumstantial evidence that the NRA may have received money from Russians. But which Russians? And was it part of the government? Well, so far, she is linked to Alexander Torshin, a government official in Russia who worked closely with Butina for years. But we don't have any evidence directly connecting Putin or the Russian government. And get this, Butina's arrest in July stemmed from what officials described as a broader counterintelligence investigation by Justice and the FBI that preceded the 2016 election. Now, this means it could have been the basis for the FISA court warrants that were taken out in July of 2016. So I see this as a much more fertile path to prove some sort of collusion between some Russians and the Trump campaign. But it doesn't have anything to do with the original claims, you know, of hacking the DNC, giving it to WikiLeaks, and meddling in our election. Have you noticed that dramatic shift? Well, finally today, Apple Computer, which I have characterized as America's biggest tax cheat, they were able to repatriate $252 billion of profits that they had stashed offshore under the grace period of the Republican corporate tax cuts that were rammed through last December. Now, as a result, the generous Apple management has agreed to spend one of those $252 billion. They've announced plans to build a new campus in Austin, Texas, with a billion-dollar price tag, an additional 15,000 employees. They also plan to add 1,000 workers in San Diego, Seattle, and Culver City, Los Angeles. But not a single one of them will be doing any manufacturing work. And finally today, I want to invite you to read a great piece by Nomi Prinz, the Wall Street whistleblower, 
It's published today at Tom Dispatch, and it's kind of a year-end accounting of the increasing gap of wealth and wage inequality. She writes, "If the global economy really is booming, as many politicians claim, why are leaders and their parties around the world getting booted out of office in such sweeping fashion?" Well, she says, we have a sense of economic instability that has continued to grow over the past decade, and it has led to, from the U.S. to the Philippines, Hungary, Brazil, Poland, Mexico, a plethora of voter upheavals. And Prinz writes later in this piece, Trump's trade wars have typically infused the world with increased anxiety and distrust toward the U.S., even as they have thwarted the ability of domestic business leaders and ordinary people to plan for the future. And a final quote from Prinz: Ultimately, what transcends geography and geopolitics is an underlying level of economic discontent sparked by 21st-century economics and resulting a resulting Grand Canyon-sized global inequality gap that is still widening. Whether the protests go left or right, what continues to lie at the heart of the matter is the way failed policies and stopgap measures put in place around the world are no longer working. Not when it comes to the 99 percent, anyway. People from Washington, Paris, London, Beijing, increasingly grasp that their economic circumstances are not getting better, and not likely to, in any presently imaginable future, given those now in power. Thanks for listening to my daily news and comment podcast. You're free to share it with absolutely everyone. You'll find it on YouTube, and I'm still Peter B. Collins. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Happy trails to you. Keep smiling.